Oh, there we go. Oh. No pressure here. States, so uh, thank all of you for doing what you do. Uh, it's a fabulous job, and there's no shortage of opinions, as we all know. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's a great gathering here today, and we're going to hear about a great, phenomenal project from Abel, uh, which actually departed from France in 1684. So you can imagine what Texas was like in six, you know, it, a few years thereafter. It's probably a little rough, Stuart, uh, for the first guys that landed here. But 1684, and that really, uh, among other things, has connected Houston and Texas with the country of France. And so we've had a lot of uh, French interactions over the years and assistance. Uh, we've had uh, the uh, like I know that uh, the Texas Historic Commission, we uh, the Historic Commission has a French legation in Austin, uh, and so France has really been a part of Texas and Texas part of France uh, for many many years. So it'll be exciting to hear about the Lavelle Project and how Texas you know came apart to discover and rescue uh, that uh, project uh, to survive for future generations for many decades. I'd like to begin by introducing an individual who has worked, who is a French consulate uh, to Houston, uh, Valerie Barabong. Uh, she is a noteworthy, uh, I am the father of four girls as well as a son. She is the first woman to hold the Consulate General Office of France in Houston. So uh, we welcome her to the stage. I'm here on behalf of the country. And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for inviting me today. It's a great, great pleasure. It's an honor for me to be with you today and to make acquaintance with uh, each and every one of you and with uh, the society to know more about your activities. Um, I arrived, yes, two years ago. Uh, I'm a diplomat, a career diplomat. And um, many things to, to say, but maybe first to dive a little bit into history. Because this is the purpose of your of your of your society to dive into history and to preserve heritage. I'm very proud to remind uh, the the Texan people here that we have a special relationship, 
you have a special relationship with Springs, and I'm very happy to be able to cultivate and to reinforce it. Because uh, not only dating back to the 17th century, yes, the first French explorers, they were there, and uh, actually they, they started really to, to have an intimate relationship with the people living here. And there are many uh, French patronymes actually in the region. But later, when Texas became independent, was a republic, France is the first, was the first foreign country to recognize the independence of the states. So the diplomatic relationship between Texas as a state, as an independent state, and France as a state, actually dates back to the 19th century. And uh, on the basis of the treaty, which was signed at the time, there was an embassy of Texas opened in Paris. And I was fortunate enough to be able to visit it last July. So I can tell maybe a little bit more about it, because you might be interested to, to visit the Texas embassy, the former Texas embassy in Paris, when you will be, when you, when you will go to, to Texas. So, in a nutshell, uh, it's un place bandeau. So, for those who know the, the map of, of Paris very well, it's very well situated. It's gorgeous, so close to la place bandeau. And um, there is the, the, the Vuitton shop. And just opposite, exactly the same hotel particulier. Uh, used to host this uh, Texas embassy. So now it's the property of the Chopin family, and uh, the building is under renovation and uh, is being transformed into a semi private hotel for the clients of uh, the Chopin family. So, uh, what is very interesting is that the family and uh, everybody working in this building wants to ex exhume, exhumate, can we say that? wants to, to make this a uh, heritage flourishing. And so they really want to, to have archives, a um, uh, copy of the treaty, pictures, letters, or whatever coming from the archives to decorate and to really make this place the place of Texas for Texan people in Paris. And uh, uh, the, same, the same thing happened, yeah, is happening in, in Austin, as you know, the French division. Uh, used to be the kind of French uh, embassy here in Texas. So you have two embassies still still on place and open to possible visits uh, in Paris and in Austin. And uh, no need also to, to remind you that uh, France was the first ally of, of the United States and that we are so proud to have offered the Statue of Liberty. So what since... <laughs> I'm, I'm here now, two years ago I arrived, and really my wish is to contribute to the flourishing of this wonderful bilateral relationship, which has really strong uh, uh, roots uh, in history and a lot of things and a lot of potential in the future. Uh, here in Houston or in Dallas, in Austin, in San Antonio, I visited the, the biggest cities, and uh, I I'm really eager to encourage uh, the visits from one side and to the other. Just to cite two examples, the city of Houston, so the deputy mayor of the Greater Houston Partnership and the Rice President, they made a trip to France last June for five days, and that was wonderful. And since that time, we have now four visits. And you probably know that Rice University has opened a footprint in Paris, in the heart of Paris, the Rice Paris Global Center, au cœur du Marais, so really in the best, best place possible within Paris. So we have a direct channel, thanks to Rice, between Houston and Paris, and there are a lot of activities going on in the field of space, new space, in the world of energy, innovation, and even humanities. So this is just an example. We also opened the trade office of friends in Dallas because we also want to increase the level of interaction between Dallas and France. And uh, the mayor of Dallas will visit France mid-November, also for one week. Okay, 
I can stop here. I will be delighted to continue the conversation with you, and uh, I wish you a wonderful lunch, and thank you again for the invitation. Uh, thank you so much. There's, uh, we're forming a delegation of women. My wife Anita has volunteered, Phoebe Tudor has volunteered, Harriet uh, Roxanne has volunteered for a trip to Paris to explore the Texas Embassy uh, history. Uh, so anyone else who wants to sign up, there's a sign-up sheet uh, here in front. Uh, please enjoy your lunch. Thank you. French is a little rusty, but um, we're so happy to have you here. I am Annette Basil. I'm the current board president of the Heritage Society, and so honored to be so. Thank you, Madam, for your remarks and for the wonderful uh, alliance that you share with us. It's incredible when you think about the relationship of Texas with France over its many centuries. And I would say that Lavelle just carries on all over our state, it seems, the mystique, history, and fascination of it. And we have several organizations here today that have uh, been involved in one way or another. First, uh, I'd like to recognize the Maritime Museum. Because the Maritime Museum, if many of you have not been there, you need to be. Uh, the Maritime Museum has always had a great exhibition on Lavelle. And here representing them is Leslie Bolland, the executive director, and Sarah Howe, the board chair, which all wait and so everybody knows where you are. Thank you. Oh, you're right there. Right over there. Thank you. And they're about to embark on a new museum facility, so it'll be even bigger and better to showcase for the Lavelle, I'm sure. Congratulations. Uh, in May, the Heritage Society uh, will learn of the possible demolition of the famed Luther Hotel in Palacios, Texas. Colossus is where the uh, archaeological dig was based for the Lavelle. And so we decided to take an ambassadorial bus trip of our members down to Colossus. And it was led by Lynn Kelly, who's here today, and historian Stephen Fox, and to help the preservation cause and learn the community's heritage. And we have a whole tribe of folks from Colossus. Uh, Edith Gower, Margaret Gowdy, Sandra Davidson, Roman McCallum, who's also the City Historic Preservation Arts Officer, and Grace Pierce. So thank you all for being here, and guess what? The look there has been saved. Yes! <laughs> but it needs a fire. So anyone who would like to thank the historic hotel for its next project, you can see that table right over there. So last year, the Heritage Society has been an exciting time. Our recently renovated museum gallery and offices have allowed the opportunity to grow our partnerships with others in the community. We have increased programming through exhibits, lectures, online presentations, children's initiatives, and we've enhanced our storytelling and interpretation of our historic homes. And with that, I would like to especially thank David Minsper, who's here with us today, He's the board chair of Houston First right now here, and that is where he wears a lot of hats, which does his wife, Lady. Uh, but Houston First is the home for Visit Houston, the tourism component of the city. And we have been participating in a program that they are sharing with us on how to interpret better activities on African American heritage at our um, museum. So we thank you for that honor. As the most diverse city in this country, it is our mission to, and I believe we are charged with helping to bring forth and tell the histories and stories of our plurality and our cultures. We invite you as an example to come and see our latest exhibit entitled, A Civil Rights Milestone, President Kennedy's Visit to Houston, that we have co-sponsored with the League of Latin American Citizens. On November 21st, 1963, 60 years ago, the night before Kennedy was assassinated, President Kennedy, Mrs. Kennedy, and the Johnsons were in Houston. President Kennedy addressed Lulac at its great state ball in the Rice Hotel. It was the first time a sitting president had ever addressed a Hispanic American organization. Hard to believe, right? Mrs. Kennedy also spoke quite in Spanish. It is a compelling and emotional story, and our exhibit showcases the power of storytelling. And the, and the importance of our state heritage in Houston. So I hope you will come and see that and the many other exhibits that we will be coming forth with. In the next year, 2024, is a milestone year as the Heritage Society will be celebrating its 70th anniversary. 
from its founding in 1954 and the 125th year celebration of the founding of Sam Houston Park as the city's first city municipal park. Hard to think about when there's well over 300 parks in our city right now, but that was the first. So please mark your calendars for March 23 for a celebratory gala to celebrate this. It will be held in the park under a tent, and we will also be working on other activities through the year, so please stay tuned. Many of our wonderful board members are with us today, and I invite our board, if you don't mind, to either stand or wave your hand to be recognized. These are the heart, this is the heart play of our organization. Please stand and be recognized. We really appreciate all your work over the years in moving us forward. Last but not least, I would like to give a shout out to our staff, our small but mighty staff team led by the ever energetic Allison Bell, who I believe is going to be here in a minute. And Laura Woods, our club director, for helping to put this event together. Heartfelt sit thanks to also to Evelyn Boatwright, our honoree, which you'll be hearing a lot more about. Uh, for her constant advice and just dedication to our organization. We are very, very grateful. Thank you, and uh, have a good lunch. Good afternoon, I'm Allison Bell. Where's my applause? Uh, as uh, as welcome said, of course, we wouldn't be here without our wonderful co-chairs, Harriet and Drew Latimer, and John Now. So we are very grateful to have them. Uh, this was all Harriet's idea, and I want you to know, Harriet, that uh, this is the largest luncheon we have had since 2007. Thanks to you. And I also want to thank Kirksey Gregg. Wave your hand, Kirksey. Thank you for donating the lens and the glorious swirls that are at your table. And before I thank our uh, underwriters, I just want to recognize that we have a few elected officials in the audience. Former Council Member Jack Christie. Where are you? There you are in the back. And Justice Meg Poisson. Did she hear yet? All right. Now I'm here to thank our major underwriters, the Faith and Charles Bybee Foundation, Harriet and Shrewd Latimer, Evelyn Boatwright, who we're honoring today, Minette and Peter Basil, the John P. McGovern Foundation, and of course, John Now, the Bogart family, and Sewell Automotive Companies, and lastly, the trustees of the Texas State History Museum Foundation, and Harriet's honor. Um, I'm going to call up right now and greet <laughs> Steve Lee Casey, our vice president of our board. Thank you, Alice, and thank you all for your attendance today, for supporting the Heritage Society and this exciting event. It's truly a pleasure and my honor to introduce to you a dear friend and our Houston Heritage Award recipient for this year. For her 37 years of service to the organization, in a variety of roles. Evelyn started with the Heritage Society in the docent department. And if any of you have seen the docent training manual that Evelyn wrote, you'll appreciate the amount of work 
that went into her very first project for the organization. The writing and teaching that and managing those volunteers who we count on to deliver Houston's history. Some people have likened that to running a college course <laughs> or even a college campus, given the campus that we're on. From that beginning, Evelyn worked on countless committees and projects at the organization leading up to term as president of the board of directors from 2011 to 2016. She's truly the embodiment of our commitment to the continuity of our mission. And I think that's why if you spend any time around the park or at any of our board or committee meetings, you're bound to have heard someone say, let's see what Evelyn thinks. <laughs> I know I've thought that many times, and she's always been gracious to receive a call and discuss whatever issue that we're dealing with. So just very quickly, I'd like to point out a few of the highlights of Evelyn's career with the Heritage Society and some of the important projects she worked on. Beginning in 1986 with the opening of the Museum Gallery, 1988, the moving restoration and opening of the Stadi House and Gardens. 1991, establishment of the Endowment Fund, which I'm happy to say is still active and healthy. 1992, the installation of the Nye House Fountain in San Houston Park. 1994, moving restoration and opening of the Yates House. 95, construction and dedication of the Connolly Plaza and the USS Houston Monument. 1997, restoration of the bandstand in the park. Going to 2002, the moving restoration and opening of Fourth Ward Cottage, our most recent structure addition to the park. 2003, relocation and reopening of Old Place. 2005, the raising of the Pelot House, 14 feet to save it from further flooding from Buffalo Bayou. That's a project near and dear to my heart, the first time I was able to work with that one. In 2008, helping develop a master plan for San Houston Park. In 2011, the restoration and opening of the Baker Family Playhouse. And in 2023, Evelyn continues to actively serve and more importantly, to lead the organization by her experience and her example. She reminds us all of our values and she inspires us to continue to volunteer our time, our skills, and our talents. And thanks to the magic of Zoom, she's been able to participate in all of the board meetings. So participating even remotely, wherever and forever would be our hope. We love you, everyone. We thank you and we say congratulations. October 3rd, 2023. Thank you. I just want to say thank you, first of all, to the board and the members of the Heritage Society for giving me this honor, and especially to Steve for that beautiful mm -hmm. and, and, and introduction. introduction. Steve and I have been dear friends for many, many years. He means a lot to me. Um, as he mentioned, that I started this 30 something years ago just as a, I thought it would be kind of a fun thing, something I've never done to take dose and training. I didn't know anything about the Heritage Society. 
Uh, but I thought it was to be done. Maybe spend a few hours a month going down there and volunteering, and that quickly mushroomed into several hours a month and years of work. But out of all that, I had received so much back. I had been given wonderful friendships and wonderful experiences, and most of all, the satisfaction of knowing that I spent my time doing something that's truly worthwhile, and that is taking the history of Houston and sharing it with everyone. And I want to thank you all. I especially want to thank my dear friend Harriet, who put this luncheon together. Harriet and I have been friends for a long, long time, and I love you. And thank you. Thank you. This is just wonderful. I also want to thank the staff and Laura Wood, especially, who has worked so hard to make this event successful. So thank you all so much. Let's uh, have another round of applause for Evelyn. Uh, I'm exhausted from just listening to everything that she's done over the years. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of just hearing about all of her efforts, so congratulations. Uh, I'd like to now bring up uh, Harriet Lever uh, to introduce our speaker. Uh, I've known Harriet and Truett for many years. Harriet's been involved in so many things uh, in the community, in the state, over these years. Uh, but her most her most successful thing she's done is she has supervised through it all these years <laughs> and kept him out of harm's way, which is a feat in and of itself. So with that, uh, I'm, I'm uh, honored to serve on the board of the Friends of the Texas Historic Commission, along with Sally Ann uh, and, and Harriet. So welcome, Harriet, to the stage. Well, thank you so much. Can you all hear me? It's way up here. Uh, thank you so much. This is going to be such an adventure and so much fun. So I appreciate your being here, and I appreciate Allison. Can anybody hear me or not? Down some more? Okay. Is that better? Okay. Um, anyway, I appreciate Allison mentioning that this is a historic event in itself, and that this is the largest lesson we have ever been able to put together. So that is really great. Uh, and we have uh, a most amazing tale to hear this afternoon, told by our own Indiana Jones, uh, sometimes known as Jim Brusa. Uh, and it was my pleasure, uh, almost, I guess, close to 15 years ago now, uh, to be part of this effort to uh, excavate the bell. And uh, it was really, really an incredible talent. We had never tried to do anything like this. And so that year, uh, Jim set out his team of archaeologists uh, in search of a big ship, as he said. Uh, and uh, amazingly, he found it really fast. Uh, and so we then knew, we the, uh, all of our friends, all of the commissioners, everybody then knew uh, that we were in deep trouble because we didn't have nearly enough resources to take care of doing anything. Uh, but everybody kind of came together in a big, big swoop. Uh, and John now and Bob Bullock got money uh, from the state, which was wonderful. And that was a huge, huge leap forward. Uh, and then uh, Hillis Allman, who is from, is from San Antonio, Scott Cabin, whom you all may know here in Houston, uh, and I uh, were asked to come to Austin to form a nonprofit friends uh, the Texas Historical Commission so that we could go out and immediately begin to raise as much money as we possibly could. So that's what happened. And I want to thank right here, stop this minute, and say many thanks to Ann Hamilton, who's here somewhere. Would you wave your hand, Ann? I know you're here. Uh, but she was our grants officer for Houston Endowment, and she made uh, every effort to work with us and Joe Nelson uh, to get uh, the very first gift that we ever got together, uh, which was to patrol uh, 
the venom, which had been discovered in that sort of event. And, uh, you know, we were really so grateful. So, Anne, did you wave your hand? I didn't see it. <laughs> There's it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. But now, now let me just tell you a little bit about uh, Indiana Jones. First of all, he's married to Tony Turner, uh, who is the most gracious, lovely, encouraging person in the whole world. And uh, she actually is the co-author of this beautiful book that you might see outside. Uh, and I urge you to, to purchase a copy. Uh, and she's a fundraiser, a friend, just the dearest person that ever was. And I would like for Tony to stand, because we need to thank Tony. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Jim started life uh, destined to be an archaeologist. Uh, his grandmother took him on a little trip uh, in Idaho, uh, and they ended up on a site where the Native Americans had camped. Uh, and while he was there, uh, he discovered an arrowhead, uh, and he was hooked from that point forward. There was no hope. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, he went back to Slidell, Louisiana, where he lived, uh, finished his uh, high school education there, went to college in New Orleans. Uh, fortunately, he was, uh, earned a business degree, which he needed, and then he took off for Texas, and he went to SMU, where he earned a, a, a bachelor's degree and also a doctorate uh, in archaeology, uh, and he was here to study. So we are so grateful Texas history would not be what it was, or is, uh, without the Bruce F. family. So I just want to tell you that he's uh, been an amazing leader all the way through this journey, and it's been a long journey, and uh, it has many, many very impressive milestones in it, uh, and I hope Jim, I'm sure Jim will tell you about those. But we are just so grateful to him and Tony for being here, uh, for being part of the Texas Historical Commission, which formed the Archaeology Division, which Jim headed. Uh, and here we were with this enormous sign underwater. Uh, and so he just went right to work immediately, uh, began to uh, do all the things that you had to do. Uh, and many years later, uh, it is safely in the Bob Bowler history. So that's what it's all about. Uh, and this is our story. Uh, it's a wild and crazy story. It's a great adventure. And I think you're going to be amazed. And so have fun. Jim. <laughs> Can y'all hear me? I'm going to use this mic and I want to walk around a little bit. Uh, and. Uh, I am going to tell you all about LaBelle, the amazing stories related to LaBelle. I'm going to take you on a journey, not just LaSalle's journey, but the journey we went on uh, locating and excavating and learning about uh, LaBelle. But before I do that, I want to say that the overall project, if you count the time that the Texas Historical Commission put, put into a staff time and everything that's gone on, all the way to the exhibit at the uh, Bullock Museum, it's been an $18 million project. A lot of the money for that has come from private philanthropic sources, and the person that made that happen is Harriet. So Harriet, would you stand one more time? Thank you. Without your work and your effort, Harriet, Nobel would not be the great project it is today. So thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to learn about Nobel. I'm going to tell you more than you probably want to know about Nobel. As you heard, I'm Jim Brissett, I'm currently a commissioner for the Texas Historical Commission, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, how LaBelle got started, and all, all goes back to this individual, Robert Cavalier Sur de La Salle. We've all heard about La Salle, we've, we've learned about La Salle going through uh, our education in high school and even earlier than that. And as part of this project, I got to study La Salle and read a lot of the documents that he had written and the people written about him and find out that he was truly an amazing explorer of the wilderness in North America, but he had a more complicated, a more interesting side to him that I found fascinating. LaSalle uh, did a lot of exploration up in the Great Lakes area in the upper Midwest, and during that exploration, he would go off with his men, and he was an arrogant individual and a difficult person to get along with, 
And the documents indicated that on those expeditions during three different episodes, his men tried to kill him by poisoning him with hemlock. <laughs> now, LaSalle was smart, and he realized that he probably couldn't change his personality. But what he could do after that, and there's a document that states this, that he kept an antidote for hemlock poisoning with him on all the future expeditions. <laughs> Very interesting character. So he did a lot of explorations of the Great Lakes. He built the first sailing ship, the Griffin, in the Great Lakes. Uh, but he's most famous for being the first uh, European that realized that the major waterway in the North American continent flows north, south the Mississippi River. And he traveled all the way down to the Mississippi River mouth in 1682. And he claimed all the land that it drained from France. And I love this George Captain painting here. Uh, LaSalle claiming all of the land that the Mississippi drains, about a third of the United States, uh, for France, in front of all these Native Americans that have no idea that this French interloper has just taken away their territory that they controlled with untold money. LaSalle decided that to hold on to this territory, he needed to come back and establish a colony at the mouth of the Mississippi River. So he headed back up to uh, Canada, sailed back to France. And went and tried to get an audience with King Louis XIV, the very active, aggressive monarch at the time, very effective uh, ruler. And at that time, King Louis XIV didn't want to give a commission to LaSalle to come back and establish a colony at the mouth of the Mississippi River. The king was complaining that his colonies in the New World, particularly in, in Canada or New France, were giving him beaver pelts. And the king of Spain was getting gold and silver from Mexico and, and, and in South America. And so why would he support yet another territorial uh, claim in the New World where it would take a lot of revenue from France with no gold and silver? So he, he didn't get an audience. LaSalle didn't get an audience. But LaSalle was determined he wanted to come back to the New World. And so he did what we do today when we want favor of our government and our government doesn't want to do it. He hired lobbyists. <laughs> and back in those days, lobbyists were members of the clergy. He had a couple of abbeys that had favor with the king, got an audience and was able to get the commission to come back to establish a colony at the mouth of the Mississippi River. And so, uh, six years later, in 1684, he set sail for four ships, including La Belle, 300 colonists, and 100 sailors through this wonderful seaport town of La Rochelle in the southwest coast of France. Uh, those towers still exist today, and, and that that, that uh, town needed a chance to travel down there. It's a beautiful uh, little village. And LaSalle came across the Atlantic Ocean, and the on the way over, he lost one of his four ships, Let's say Francois, a small catch, was captured by pirates. The Caribbean at that time was rife with uh, of pirates, and so that ship was lost. So, and then also I should say that LaSalle had arrangements with the, the king and his advisors to be right in this area here, at an island, the governor of that French um, colony, saint um waiting for LaSalle to give him official welcome coming to the French colony there on LaSalle's efforts to get to the Mississippi River. But while at sea, LaSalle wasn't in charge of the ships. And the person who's in charge was Captain Pochou, and he and the sailors had a different idea. They didn't want to go to this formal recognition of the governor welcoming to the French colony in the, in the Caribbean. They wanted to go to a little community or a little town called Tite Croix. And one of the wonderful things I love about archaeology, when it's what we call historical archaeology, is that we have documents that help us understand why decisions were made. And in this particular case, we have one individual, Henri Chutel, who keeps a detailed journal of the whole expedition, and he gives us wonderful details and wonderful insights into the decisions people are making during the overall uh, expedition. And for Pequot, here's what he says. The Pequot is a place where the air was bad, the fruit the same, and there are a great many women worse than the air of the fruit. <laughs> So you can put two and two together and perhaps understand what was going on at the time. But the people have said that that can't be true. This, these are actual historical documents, the facts in the case. So LaSalle stayed in deep water for a period of time. Then he uh, continued on his journey to the Mississippi River. Oh, I should mention that some of the, when they were in deep water, some of LaSalle's colonists defected to became pirates. 
Uh, Petite Wild is a place where people of different walks of life were intermingling, and some of the colonists were told that where you were headed was a bad place to go, and so they said, well, we're not going to go with LaSalle, we'll join the pirates and go get rich. We'll link up with those pirates a little bit later. So LaSalle then continued his uh, expedition, missing the Mississippi River by 400 miles, coming within 70 miles of the landing in Texas. Now, how in the world did he land in Texas thinking he was at the mouth of the Mississippi River? As part of our uh, investigations on this project, we found the map that guided LaSalle in his journey to the New World. And this was made by, Matt, by LaSalle, his map maker, John Baptiste Louis Franklin. And it's from 1684. And you can see here that it's got the general outline of the North America pretty well. But let me show you where LaSalle decided his Mississippi River was within the continent. Starts up in the upper Midwest, goes on down, goes way to the west, almost to the Mexico, and comes in to the Gulf of Mexico, way over here, near where the Rio Grande does today. So you can see why where why LaSalle ended up where he did. He thought that was in fact where the Mississippi River was coming into uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And exactly where he ended up was Matagorda Bay. And while he was there, he wrote three letters to the king. Uh, to be delivered later on, and each letter he signed at De La Salle at a branch of the mouth of the Mississippi River on the Gulf of Mexico. He still thought that he was uh, at the right place. So La Salle offloaded uh, supplies that he had, established uh, uh, our first European colony in the eastern part of Texas, Fort St. Louis. He tried to bring in his big supply ship, Le Mans, and five times bigger than uh, La Belle, had a lot of the, the goods he needed for his colony. Coming in to pass the bayou at Ran Brown, and he lost all of that uh, cargo that he had. Big, big loss for the, uh, the the overall colony effort. Then a third ship, Le Jali, it had orders from the king to uh, come to France, offload the cargo, offload the colonists, and sail back to uh, France. And he did that. And interestingly, on the way back to France, it got lost in the Caribbean. It encountered a, a uh, English ship. The English ship took it to Jamestown. Uh, that this French ship stayed in, in Jamestown for a period of time until it continued the, it, its uh, journey back to what, France. So in 1685, LaSalle was down to a single vessel, Lavelle, his lifeline to get help, uh, his lifeline to go to the Caribbean or even sail back to France if he needed to. So uh, LaSalle is at Fort St. Louis. He's going overland trying to find. The Mississippi River. He can't find it. He decides that it's got to be up to the northeast. And so he decides what he's going to do then is load everything he has left for his Mississippi River colony into the ship. He's going to sail as far as he can uh, northeast to Matagorda Bay. He's going to anchor. He'll go overland, find his river. And I should mention he left an anchor with 27 people, but he was going to go overland, find his river, come back, pick up LaBelle and sail around to the Mississippi River and establish his colony. So he takes off. He tells the people on board, LaBelle, stay put, don't move, I'm coming back in two weeks. And from the journal, we learned that the two weeks come and go, the people on board the ship are running low water. They send their best sailors ashore to try and get uh, more, more water. And those sailors never come back. The Toronto Indians, who are hostile towards the south at this point, uh, certainly uh, uh, killed those, those individuals. Uh, LaSalle's men, when they first landed in Matagorda Bay, they stole some of the Toronto Indian canoes, and to the Toronto, that was a declaration of war, and they were after the stage ever, ever after that. So the journal tells us that they lost their single longboat, and the men on board the ship continued to, to decline, and the water's running so low, and it reaches the point that people, some people even die of thirst on board Lavelle. The journal also tells us that the captain, Pierre Tessier, or he's also called the pilot, he controlled everything on board the ship. And for him to survive, he took control of all the brandy and the wine. And the diary says there was a day that went by that he wasn't drunk all day. Finally, in, in February 1686, things get so dire that LaSalle decides he's going to pull up anchor. He's going to sail around the Fort St. Louis colony and get help. And as he does that, I mean, not for the south, but uh, Pierre Tessier decided to pull up anchor and sail around to Port St. Louis. And as he gets ready to do that, probably being drunk, a strong cold front uh, blows in, and they lose control of the ship. It drifts, and it directs right about there. 
Uh, the 27 men, six of them eventually get to Vancouver Peninsula, right over here. They stay there for a couple months until miraculously an Indian canoe watches on shore. They get on it and they sail back to Fort St. Louis to tell about the loss of LaBelle. LaSalle comes back, hasn't found the Mississippi River, and realizes that his colony now with the loss of LaBelle is on the edge of total failure. He's got to do something dramatic. So he decides he's got to get help, and the only way he can get help is he can't go into today's Mexico because the Spanish are enemies of the French, and that won't work out very well. So he decides his only hope is to walk to Canada to get help. <laughs> so in 1687, about a year later, he, he starts off on his journey with 17 men headed for Canada. And on the way, and I'm going to show you a very rare historical document that we found that tells us about what happens at the next stop for LaSalle on his way to Mexico. And you're going to hear the name Nika. And Nika refers to an Indian guide that LaSalle has with him. But uh, here's what happens. Oh. LaSalle was murdered, shot in the head by his men. He was left in the woods. The, the men took his clothing, uh, and that's how the great explorer lost his life in uh, Texas. Meanwhile, six people continued the journey, headed on up, walking all the way up to Quebec. They got on a ship, they traveled back to France including Henri Chatel, the man that kept the journal of the whole expedition. And that's how we have the details about all aspects of this incredible journey uh, into uh, the New World and through the New World and back to France. And in 1713, Henri Chatel published this journal. And back at this time, these, these catalogs of exploration of the New World and encounter with the American Indians was all the rage. So Chatel published it. And that's the document that we get all these details from. But he also put in there a map, which is fascinating. Uh, this is sort of the final thinking that the French had after being in Matagorda Bay for the, the, the few years they were, and then making their way back to, some of them making their way back to uh, France. I should mention, one of the individuals that made his way back to France was Pierre uh, the, the, the Pessier, the, the pilot of Flavelle. Anyways, if you look at this map from the, the book that um, uh, we all put together, you can see they've got the Mississippi River in the right location pretty much. You can see the outline of North America, how you blow that up. But they still think there's a channel of the Mississippi River coming to Matagorda Bay. Even at that late date, they haven't given up on that idea. And you know, Sal was right, he just didn't find that, that, that channel in Matagorda Bay. And it did see how they oversized uh, Matagorda Bay. So finishing up the story of the, uh, the people remaining at uh, Port St. Louis, the Toronto Indians attacked and massacred most of the, well, all the adults, captured the children to be raised as Indian children. And then off the shore of Mexico, near Veracruz, Mexico, a Spanish encounter a pirate ship. And on that pirate ship are some of LaSalle's colonists who defected. One is the niece of Moss, and we have an interrogation that they did that exists today. And uh, young uh, Tomas had befriended one of LaSalle's uh, servants. So he knew what was going on, that King Louis XIV was trying to establish a French colony in land claimed by Spain on, on maps. And so the interrogation took place. That information was sent back to the King of Spain and the Council of Indies. And it terrified the, the Spanish about what the aggressive French monarch was up to. And there's a document saying that the Council of the Indies concluded that if they didn't stop the French in their part of the New World, that they might lose control of all their holdings in, in the New World, which is pretty amazing when you consider how extensive their holdings were. And so that started a manhunt to find the La Salle colonists. Uh, Eleven expeditions were started from the Mexico-Spanish colonies and then from the Caribbean. And in 1689, General Alonso de Leon finds the remains of Fort St. Louis, and we have this map of his uh, his expedition leaving Coila, and each letter here is a stop on their way up to a bay that looks like Madagascar Bay. Blow that up, and here at uh, on this map at F, they find the remains of Fort St. Louis, and then they head down to Madagascar Bay, and for modern day nautical archaeologists, they do something amazing. 
They make a map of the bay, and they show Lavelle, three years later, still sticking out of the water. The bottom part was underwater. And, and so that we don't quite understand it, they even label it Navio Quebrado, broken ship, shipwreck. So this is the document that modern day archaeologists use to know Lavelle's out there somewhere, because if you look at this bay here to Manford Bay, it's similar, it had to be the right location for Lavelle. So let's switch gears now and talk about how do you find a shipwreck uh, today. And basically, the way you do that is that you take a vessel like you see here, and you drag behind it a magnetometer. And the magnetometer is like a super sensitive metal detector, so sensitive it'll pick up one one millionth of the magnetic force it takes to move a compass needle. And the idea is that all ships have iron on them, and iron is slightly magnetic. And by dragging this across the water, you can locate targets where there's magnetism down below. The, the fly ointment, though, is that we have, we have dumped so much pipe and metal iron, you know, iron into our, our bays and rivers from sh other shipwrecks, modern shipwrecks, and from oil exploration and stuff like that, that you often find lots of false targets. Anyways, we went in 1995. We decided we would do the uh, the survey to see if we could locate the uh, bell dragging the magnetometer. We had to go back here. Dragging the oops. there we go. Dragging the magnetometer back here and recording all of the readings it's given us on our computers. And we were so amazed at the time these things here. It looked like it should be in the Smithsonian Institution today as an exhibit. Nonetheless, we identified uh, uh, a number of targets, and then we prioritized them from the best to the worst, and we went back out to start checking out the, uh, the targets. Now, Matagorda Bay is shallow, 12 feet deep, but it has zero visibility. So when you dive on down, you don't see anything. You do everything by touch. And that first dive down on a target, you don't know if it's going to be the old shipwreck you're looking for, or a shrimp boat that went down maybe 20 years ago with outriggers maybe still out and then some of the netting still in place where you may get tangled up. So typically in these kinds of projects, we'd send the students down first to see what they can locate. <laughs> and then uh, and if they came back up, then the rest of us go down and kind of check it out. So we sent the students on down and they went down there and they said something amazing has been found down there. We could feel the lifting handles of a cannon. And we said, well, that means we have an old shipwreck. We need to bring the cannon up to see if it's got some descriptions on it that can help us. And a few days later, we bought this beautiful bronze cannon. And as we started looking at it, up here on the chase, it's got the insignia of Le Comte de Hermann Roth. He was made in Apple, France from 1669 to 1683. We did some additional research and found out that uh, the count was made to Apple, France when he was two years old. And further research showed us that uh, he was an illegitimate child of King Louis XIV. And that was a way to recognize the, uh, the young count. The uh, lifting handles here are, are shaped, in the, shaped in the form of leaping dolphins. It truly is a piece of art. And down here is the official royal crest of King Louis XIV. We had found La Belle. Amazing. The first target we checked out turned out to be the uh, shipwreck. Uh, incredible, incredible discovery. I've been uh, throughout Europe giving lectures on LaBelle. Today it's considered one of the important shipwrecks up there with uh, the Vasa, the Mary Rose. I've even been in presentations where the Titanic has been uh, discussed. It's, it's really great to see this project having gone so far. So how do we excavate it? Well, given the zero visibility, it'd be difficult to do a typical underwater excavation where you can't see anything you're bringing up, you probably would damage fragile artifacts. So we decided to do something that had never been done in this hemisphere, hemisphere before from nautical archaeology, and that's to build a steel structure around it, what's called a cofferdam. And that's where we decided we would proceed with it. So here is a diagram of the cofferdam. We had uh, sheet piling that you see here, 57 feet long. Milled in Pennsylvania, shipped down by barge, extra long sheet piling, and then two rows of it going around the, uh, the, the, the shipwreck, uh, going down over 40 feet into the bed of Matagorda Bay to keep water from coming up underneath. A special sand was put in between the two walls of sheet piling that has the property that when it gets moist, it compacts. And the engineers told us that when you, when you 
build this, we can't make it watertight. Water's going to leak through, but you need to have sump pumps in there that can keep up with the water leakage to pump the water out. And we did build it. Here it is. You can see it. Uh, here is uh, our vessel that we had. We stayed in the wonderful town of Plashes. The people of Plashes were so, so welcoming to us as our headquarters on land. Every day we would travel an hour and 15 minutes out to the copper dam. Here we had screens where we could screen the sediments for small artifacts. Here we had a building where uh, we kept our computers and somebody slept out there each night to uh, protect the, the project. Here is a crane for lifting heavy objects out from inside the copper dam. And here is probably the most important piece of the equipment on the copper dam. That is a shed that had two diesel generators. They had to run 24 hours a day to provide electrical support for the uh, sump pumps to pump the water out. They worked great. We had a couple times during storms where we've lost uh, electrical support. Water did start coming into the copper dam, but we're able to get the sump pumps going again to reestablish the, uh, the, the dry conditions inside the copper dam. So what did we find? Well. Here's what it looked like. You're looking at the bottom third of the hull with cargo in it. The upper two thirds was eaten away by tornado worms, little mollusks that live in the, in, the, in, the, in the water. But what we found down here uh, was uh, 86 barrels and 10 boxes with cargo that LaSalle brought over to establish the colony in the New World. If you count the, the little glass beads and the lead bullets, we found 1.8 million artifacts on board that ship. And what they represent is, a, is what was needed for an explorer coming to the New World to build a colony in the New World. This is the only place in the world those objects have been found together. In other cases, a ship was wrecked and scattered. Everything got scattered around. Or the colony was successful. The, the expedition was successful to establish the colony. So people ask, did you find gold or silver? No, but we found something I think even more historically important is that we can peer back into the mind of the explorer coming to the New World. What did you need to establish a colony in the New World in the 17th century? The, the silt that had covered the wreck created an anaerobic environment, uh, low oxygen, which meant that the bacterial decay was very, very minimal. And so we had amazing preservation of organic artifacts. This is anchor rope. Um, we found 800 linear feet of anchor rope coiled up in the bow of the ship. Uh, preserved in, in beautiful condition. In the middle of it, we found a human skeleton. Here we go. Uh, an adult male, uh, late 30s to early 40s, laying uh, face down, and next to him is a water cask. Undoubtedly, one of the people that died of thirst on board Lavelle. This individual uh, decided that his last resting his days would be his last days of life. Life would be coiled up on the coil of anchor rope in the bow of the ship. And as we excavated further, we found that he not only died there, but he was living in this part of the ship. You gotta realize that LaBelle was a small vessel, 54 feet long, 14 feet wide, had a single deck. The captain and his officers had a little cabin in the back. This individual probably decided he would live in the bow of the ship, and the passengers. Uh, probably about 25 passengers, they had the option of either being out on the deck of the ship, if the weather was bad, they could go below deck and sit on the cargo. And those are the, 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 the sleeping quarters that they had at the time. These ships of ex exploration were not to give people luxury accommodations coming over the New World. They were to get people to the New World to accomplish the mission that they had. So we found that uh, this individual was living there. We found one of his shoes right here by him. And we found this little computer cup that has a name on it, probably his name, C. Barange. And then this is a uh, facial reconstruction that we did of Mr. Barange, what he would have looked like. I should mention that we found remains of a, uh, a second set of human remains, mostly the long bones of, of a person, uh, a very tall person. And we've recently been able to do the DNA uh, reconstruction of Mr. Barange and the other set of remains, and we thought both had to be French. The second set came back to be Native American. And we, the only thing we could figure is that when LaBelle was wrecked and sticking above water, 
the Kronko Indians knew that there was cargo down inside that thing. And one of the Kronko Indians, they were very tall people, that fits the stature of the, of the remains we found, decided to dive on down into the cargo hold and got uh, disoriented down there and lost his life. So what did we, well, I should say, um, not only what we found, but how do you get artifacts out of a, um, a shipwreck? Uh, the problem we have with marine archaeology projects is that the sediments in the uh, seawater uh, start forming a, a concretion around iron objects. And, uh, and they kind of cement things together. And so we have to use whatever techniques are appropriate to, to extricate artifacts. This is a pneumatic chisel that we're using to uh, free away the uh, uh, the concretion, the open sediment. So, uh, working on this, and I directed the project from 1990, fall of 1996 to the spring of 1997. Every day, we would bring up a new barrel or box and open it up and see something amazing uh, that LaSalle felt like he needed to bring to the new world. Here, you can see this particular, oops, this particular, long button here, this particular uh, barrel, we took off some of the staves here, and it's filled with access. We found over 800 accents in four different barrels. All the blades kind of pointing to the middle. Here's what the accents uh, look like. LaSalle could make the axe handles. We didn't find any axe handles. He could make those in the New World, but he couldn't make the blades. We brought over hundreds of these, these accents for his calling. Uh, we found uh, these, these objects. This is a, a picture for wine. Uh, even on board the ship, they wanted to have a fine picture to be able to pour their French wine to uh, consume on, on, on the ship. Uh, these items here are these jars. They contain, uh, they are medicine jars. They contain uh, medicines. When we found them, the contents were still there, but uh, certainly uh, uh, have been waterlogged for a long period of time. We couldn't really analyze them. This is a, uh, a, a handle for some sort of a cooking tool. This is a skimmer with a wooden handle is lost, but the skimmer part is there for skimming foods out of a uh, liquid. And then finally, this is a pewter plate on a shipwreck. Pewter plates were your, your plate of choice because if you dropped it, they didn't break. And that ship was always moving and the ceramic vessels would break uh, often. This here is a, a box we found. You can't see it very well, but here's the bottom part of the box. And in it, we found all of these, these uh, copper pebbles in here, brass pebbles. And this actually here is, is a, uh, a strainer or a, co a colander. And you can see the floral pattern to it, the holes in it. Here is a soup a ladle. Here are candlesticks. We found uh, a number of wine bottles and brandy bottles. And every one was empty. It had been opened and empty. <laughs> And then uh, on shipwrecks, what's also amazing is that one of the first things that disappears is iron. It rusts away, corrodes away. But before it does it, that marine sediment forms around it, and it forms a perfect mold of what the original iron object was. And so you can take these concretions, and you can crack them in half, clean out the interior, and pour epoxy in there, and recover what the iron object was that has now disappeared. So here is a... Concretion, uh, what was inside of a concretion? Uh, this case folding knife here uh, is epoxy. That was recovered by pouring epoxy into the remains of the mold inside of the concretion. Here, these, these case knives, uh, here the blade is epoxy, recovered from the concretion. Ironically, the wood handle is original. And show you the preservation was so good, we found evidence of things like this. This is wax paper that was used to wrap around knife blades to protect them during the journey. These are buttons with crochet material on. Here's part of the uniform. And then this box, I actually got to excavate this. This is a wooden box, about one foot wide, one foot deep, three foot long. Opened it up, had nothing but glass beads. We had them uh, tested, they were made in Venice. And uh, they were packed by color. You can see here the white ones, and they're blue ones here, black ones here. And as I excavated on down, the string was still there holding the, the strands of beads together. So these, these items, and I'll show you some more, were trade items for the Indians that LaSalle 
brought with him. He knew when he came to the New World, he was going to have to take advantage of trade with the Indians to get information to help get them to help him find things he's looking for, and perhaps even to trade for food. And in this one box, there are over 600,000 uh, glass beads. Here's some other trade items. Uh, this this is the uh, the point out of a powder flask. That's not a trade item, but these are all trade items. Uh, these brass pins. Was out brought over to trade to the Indians. In Jutel's diary, we learned that a single brass pin could be traded for a completely cured deer hide. Metal, the, the Indians at this time had no metal, and metal like this was so amazing to them that they were willing to do whatever trades they needed to get these items. These are uh, brass bells in France. They were used for falconry. You put them on your pet falcon, and when it was flying around, you couldn't see it, you could hear where your falcon was. Indians had no interest in falconry. They, they sewed these bells onto their clothing, and when they would dance, they would jingle, and they, they, they very much uh, like that. And then finally down here, these are Jesuit rings, little uh, cheap rings with a religious uh, motif stamped on it, and our image stamped on it, and the Indians had no idea what the religious motif meant, but loved, loved the rings and would trade uh, many things of value to the French for these, these objects. And we also found the board Lavelle and Arrowhead. And it's missing the tip, if I had to guess, and we know that some of those Los Alamos men were, had been, the board Lavelle had been wounded with Indian arrows. Uh, I would guess that the tip of that would probably was embedded in someone, somebody's uh, arm in, in the bone, and that's the part of the arrow and the, and the arrowhead that they were able to recover uh, out of the wound. And we found these things all over the ship. They are the eight cases for cockroaches. That ship was, was riddled with cockroaches. They were everywhere. And I'm sure back then they were in your food. You just moved them out of the way and you just ate, ate the food. And we also found lots of examples of the, of the ship rat. There were ship rats all through that ship. Back then, you didn't think twice about that. And the most important uh, artifact was hull itself and removed it timber by timber. Now, I, and so the uh, the agent of preservation of the, our artifacts was the water they were in, and so none of those objects as we excavated them could be allowed to be air dried. They would warp, they would disintegrate, so they all had to be put into these vats that we had all over the top of the coffer dam with uh, seawater in to preserve them. And I should mention that in the coffer dam, we did have a public viewing area where over the course of our seven month excavation, over 29,000 people took an hour boat, boat ride out to see us and they would always be watching us above as we were excavating. And I remember one day, it was a cold day, and there was just one man with his young daughter with him. And I could hear his young daughter ask, what do they feed the archaeologists? <laughs> <laughs> and so, that, and this is very confusing to anybody, but to that young girl, I think she thought this was like a zoo for archaeologists. <laughs> Everything that we found was sent to uh, Texas A&M. They had a world-class conservation laboratory there. So they, over uh, uh, more than a decade, have treated all the artifacts. Uh, have spent, we've spent millions of dollars on this so that they all can be air-dried and displayed in, in museum exhibits. And the hull itself, we, uh, we treated the timbers. We reassembled the timbers. We treated them in polyethylene glycol initially. Polyethylene glycol is a synthetic wax of a byproduct or a product of uh, oil, and it is a wonderful preservative. Um, it is such a good preservative. It's also used in ladies' cosmetics, and uh, it uh, also. And my wife always says, "Don't tell them this," but I'm going to tell you. Uh, those of us that are at the age where we have to have a colonoscopy, polyethylene glycol is one of the drinks that you have to make you get ready for your colonoscopy. <laughs> it's got a multitude of uses. So we did this for a period of time, and uh, price of oil skyrocketed, and we couldn't afford the polyethylene glycol to continue with that process. So we finished up the preservation of the Lavelle timbers by disassembling 
the hull one more time and building the world's largest freeze dryer for marine archaeology artifacts at Texas A&M University. And the principle here is that if you put the artifacts into the freeze dryer, it's about 45 feet long to accommodate the largest uh, timber that we had, the length of it. Uh, it works by the process, well, freeze drying works by, by the process of sublimation. What you do is inside here, you take and you, you, you freeze the water that's in the wooden timbers. And then sublimation is where the, the, water, the, the water will go from a, a solid directly to a gas. And so you have a, 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 a low pressure area in there, vacuum in there that pulls the moisture out. And it pulls it out very evenly so it doesn't warp the timbers. If you let the timbers just simply dry with the water in them, the water will come out differentially. And it'll warp and, and, and break apart, in some cases disintegrate, the wooden objects, or the wooden timbers. And it worked beautifully, uh, the freeze dryer did. Uh, this is a model built by a French model builder. This is actually in Paris, at the Maritime Museum in Paris. And uh, Lobel was a beautiful ship, appropriate name, Lobel. Again, a mansion 54 feet long, shallow draft vessel that La Salle could use to sail along the Gulf Coast to explore when he got to the uh, New World. The uh, main exhibit of Lobel artifacts today is at the Texas State History Museum. And in 2016, when we had finished the conservation of the hull timbers, we brought them to uh, the Bullock Museum in Austin, and uh, we reassembled the timbers as a live exhibit, which is really spectacular to have people come and watch us putting the ship together. And today, if you go to the museum, in the atrium of the museum, you'll see the wonderful exhibit of Lobel here, the bottom third of it, and you'll see these incredible display pieces here that go up 15 feet high in, 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 um, in terms of the uh, level. And the idea there was not to show you one or two accidents, but to show you all 800, show you all the thousands of glass beads, so you get an idea as to the huge quantities of some objects that were South brought with them that he needed in those quantities to make his colony successful. Really recommend uh, checking out the exhibit in the atrium of the Bullock Museum. We published a, a, a few books on the bill. This one is for sale from a wider grave, the discovery and excavation of the South Shipwreck Bell. I wrote with my, my wonderful wife. Uh, this one is the big Bible. It's got details on everything related to our excavations. It's called the Bell Archaeology of the 17th Century Ship of World, New World Colonization. And we have this book, which is not for sale, but you can get this on Amazon. It's Lobel, The Ship That Changed History. And in this book, we talk about how Lobel did change the course of Texas history. At the time that uh, LaSalle was here, uh, there were no Spanish people in 99.9% .9 of Texas. Spain claimed Texas on a map with today's Texas, but didn't occupy it. The, the presence of the French caused um, Spain to realize they had to occupy the area. And the sinking of our ship, Lobel, stopped the French effort to establish a colony in today's Texas and ultimately on the Mississippi River mouth. If that ship had not gone down in that storm, it's entirely possible that our heritage today would be like Louisiana's French. But the sinking of that ship doomed La Salle's colony and caused Spain to realize they needed to occupy the area and resulted in our wonderful Hispanic heritage that we have today. So it's very interesting to see how a small event in our, our past history can have dramatic change in the course of events that follow, resulting in our heritage that we have. I also have these two books uh, out there, these are magazine articles, these are free, grab one, they give us more information about the little bell shipwreck and our work on it. And then finally, I have a few more tales on, from a watery grave. And here I'm going to talk about some of the more interesting things that uh, happened during our excavations, or the interesting things that we found. And I should say, I'm, talking, I'm just scratching the surface on many amazing things that we learned or happened to us. And in our books, you can learn more about that. And also, uh, PBS Nova did a documentary on this shipwreck uh, many years ago, and that's available uh, online through PBS. LaSalle's real motive for coming to Texas. Well, you know, I talked about how LaSalle had to get the uh, lobbyists to get him uh, the audience with the king to get his commission. Uh, king Louis XIV agreed to it, but also for one other motive, that he wanted to get 
rich from uh, the gold and silver in the New World. And in fact, um, that was a big motivator for King Louis XIV. And at the time, uh, Los Al was coming over, Spain was getting 60% of its New World wealth from the silver mines of northern Mexico. And there was a secret plan that Los Al had with King Louis XIV to uh, actually uh, investigate where the silver mines were. And later on, a French army was going to come over to take over those, those silver mines. And there's an account that the Comano Indians in the, in the Rio Grande, the big, big men of the Rio Grande, uh, encountered Los Al's men. And Los Al's men were asking the Indians, how far are the silver mines, how well are they guarded, and how good are the roads? Los Al was doing a reconnaissance to follow up with the French invasion. It never happened because the colony failed, but he was doing this, his job as to what King Louis XIV wanted him to do. And the evidence we have for this is these items right here on board the bell. These are the cards. These are like little portable cannons. Uh, basically, you put them on the side, you put gunpowder in them, you put them up against a stockade of, let's say, a Spanish presidio, and uh, you would light a fuse and it would blow open the uh, stockade to gain access to the, uh, the Spanish uh, fortification in the event that La Salle was to, to, to encounter these people. We also found these. These are called fire pots. Much like a Molotov cocktail, they work with gunpowder. Basically, you would take this fuse right here, would be filled with gunpowder, I mean, this is a grenade right here with a fuse holder. You put it in the, the strand fire pot, the gunpowder around it, and then you bring the fuse on out and you put this on top, and the fuse would come out here. And basically, if you came up to an enemy stockade and you wanted to fight the people into, inside of it, you could light the fuse, throw this thing over the wall of the stockade. He would, he would land, the gunpowder would blow up the ceramic uh, pot here, and as for people, as people were coming out to put out the fire, then the, the grenade would go off and send a shrimp mail around to injure and wound people. We found, uh, I guess, about 10 of these on board uh, Orbel. Again, an offensive weapon if Los Al was to encounter the uh, Spanish. Who owns Lobel? Somebody asked me that. Well, we thought Texas owned it, but we found it in Matagorda Bay. And uh, after we excavated it in 1997, the Republic of France filed an official claim to our U.S. State Department saying France owns Lobel. And the reason for that is that they found this document in Rochefort where Lobel was built. And at the top it says, Vessels of the King in the Department of Rochefort. And right there is a listing for our ship, Lobel. So it's 50 tons, six cannons on deck, built in Rochefort. Henri Mallet was the master shipwright that built the ship. Had to grab it seven feet. And Mr. De La Salle has taken her to Mexico, from which she has not yet returned. <laughs> and on the basis of this document, the, the, the France made the claim. Uh, the U.S. State Department sent the claim to us in Texas. We were preparing to legally argue that it does not belong to France, but belongs to the United States. Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State at the time, said, we've talked to the U.S. Navy and we don't want to fight the claim. We don't care about the claim of an old shipwreck like that. We'd be more worried if one of our nuclear submarines went down in French waters. We don't want to have something that's going to complicate further negotiations with France. So that set in motion that uh, uh, we would negotiate a, a international treaty on the bill, which we did. Oh, and I should say here, one last entry over here uh, on the left says, the number of crew members is not given for this vessel because the pilot which just returned says that she no longer exists. That's Pierre Tessier, the drunken captain on board the bell. He was one of the six people that walked back to uh, Canada, sailed back, made his way, I guess at the very end, thinking he needed to do something good for the expedition, expedition and tell us that the ship had in fact been lost. But uh, we negotiated an international uh, treaty on, on LaBelle, and we uh, basically, the treaty says that LaBelle is owned by France, and all the artifacts are owned by France. But the artifacts remain in Texas, uh, unless both France and Texas agree that they go to another location. And that treaty was signed in the treaty room at the U.S. State Department with a French ambassador here and a deputy secretary of state over here. Uh, and in that treaty, I inserted in there that would be the exchange of scholars back and forth, and that's got me several paid-for trips to France to study. 
what they all artifacts and go through the archives. And my last tale of from a watery grave is Gruber Lake, Plummy, Espanola, New Mexico. Now, people always wonder, what, what is he doing now? Has he gone off script here? <laughs> well, if you remember back when the salvage murder, this individual here, John Marchbeck, he participated. He signaled the sal to come forward. Well, this individual here, Duho, actually shot him. The person that shot him and some other members, they got into arguments and they actually killed each other up with the Catalinian. But John Marchbeck survived. And uh, he said, well, I can't go back with the others to Quebec and then over to France because I'll be found out and I'll be hung in, 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 in France for helping murder LaSalle. So from where LaSalle was killed, somewhere around the Minnesota, Texas, large of decided he'd go live with the Cato Indians. And he did that. And stayed there. And there he met another defector of one of LaSalle's uh, expeditions looking for the Mississippi River of Chakra Lake was living with the cattle, and they became good friends. And after about a year, they said, you know, the, the cattle are very nice people to us, but we want to be with other Europeans. And so one of them had this amazing piece of uh, parchment here with the picture of a ship. Not one of our ships, but another ship. And on it, they wrote letters to the Spanish. Here you can see one of them, and the other letter here, they're hard to read. They're basically your letters to the Spanish saying, we are Frenchmen. Or Christians who want you to come and get us and take us to be with other Christians. And so they give those letters, that, that letter, that parchment to the Hamano Indians who are traveling throughout Texas. They take it down to Presidio, San Francisco, the Atantos, the Spanish Presidio, give it to them. The Spanish get it and say, Whoa, there's still French people out there. We gotta go get them. And so they head on up there and they get those two guys. They bring them on back and they interrogate them. And we had those interrogations to give us more details about the expedition. They take them down to Mexico City and they interrogate them again. And then they say, well, what do we do with these guys now? Let's send them to Spain and put them in prison. <laughs> so they're sent to Spain, they're in prison for a couple of years. Then uh, the Spanish government in Mexico says, you know, we have these silver mines in northern Spain and we've been using a lot of uh, Native American or Indian people to occupy the uh, the silver mines, but it's hard work, and the Indians have refused to do that. And they said, well, why don't we get those prisoners, all the prisoners we have in Spain, let's bring them to the New World, and put them to work in those silver mines. So our two individuals make their way back to Mexico City, ended up in the silver mines. Then, uh, in 1692, uh, Don Diego uh, de Vargas is mounting an expedition to reconquer New Mexico. In 1680, the Pueblo Indians had kicked out the Spanish. In 1692, they were going to come back and reoccupy the area. And in the process, they, uh, they, need, they need people to go with them, uh, some Spanish people to go with them. And so they offer some of the prisoners the opportunity to participate in the recolonization of New Mexico. And I'm sure uh, Larcher and Rolle were delighted to do that. And they signed up, and they ended up going with the Vargas to Santa Fe, and they stayed up there. And they lived up there, and they married up there, and uh, had families. And they changed their names from Jacques Rollet to John the Architect to Santiago Rollet <laughs> and Juan Arquebete. And today, if you travel around Albuquerque, you're likely to see this sign, Injured Autorac, called Arquebete. <laughs> That's one of the LaSalle's descendants. It's colony, colony descendants. And then if you travel north of Santa Fe to Espanola, you're likely to see this sign, Guru Lake Plumbing, another descendant from LaSalle's colonist in the New World. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. So feel free to get up and, and make your final bids and things like that. I'll answer any questions if you have them here for just a few minutes before we continue on with the program. Hearing none, Wilson, welcome to come on up here, and Mr. Wilson. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, let's have another round of applause for Jim.
can't remember what I've been doing since 1997, but definitely wasn't recovering a 300 year old ship like he did. So, very interesting story, very interesting. It's great we have it in Austin. Uh, thank you, Harriet, for organizing all that. Um, these things just don't happen by accident. Again, I'd like to thank Harriet and Pruitt, uh, co host with John Now. Uh, great Texan, great history supporters of Texas and the United States. So thank you for chairing the event. Uh, like Jim said, uh, the uh, silent auction will remain open for another 10 minutes. Uh, check out in 20 minutes. And also your the lovely uh, uh, flower uh, table settings in your table have been donated uh, and they're available for $40. So that anyone who wants to purchase one of these beautiful uh, settings, uh, just do it at the checkout. Everyone have a great afternoon and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.